Hey, praise the Lord, guys. Uh, another great time of uh, worship. We're going to just continue in our study through the book of Hebrews, if you'd like to follow along in Hebrews. Now, uh, just one, one announcement, guys. Uh, the National Day of Prayer is happening tomorrow, actually, Thursday, May the 5th. It's happening at the State Capitol Rotunda at 6 p.m. I know that many within the body of Christ will be coming out to attend and to participate. Uh, some of the pastors and leaders will lead the assembly in prayer and should be a great time of worship and uh, the word and prayer and praise. So plan on coming out for that. Hopefully things around the, the parking around the Capitol will kind of uh, open up around that time as most people are leaving uh, work for home. So come on out for that. And you know, with, the, with this new development with Roe v. Wade, guys, uh, the abortion uh, uh, on demand, uh, soon to be struck down, Lord. Uh, it's a good time to, uh, again, uh, just show your colors and come out and stand. And you know, our, our, um, our legislators have, are, are already uh, taking their stand. They're already figuring out what they're gonna do. But come on out and stand in support for the things of the unborn child and the, the right to life. And uh, uh, again, it's a great thing. Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. Here in chapter 13, it seems that we pick up right where we left off in our second John study last time on this past Sunday, guys. Uh, in, in verse 1, it uh, simply says, the Spirit says, let love of the brethren continue. And uh, we recall that as we, we discussed God's command to us uh, that we ought to be loving one another, guys. It was not only uh, thinking Christian love as this uh, touchy-feely, a warm, fuzzy feeling or emotion that makes us reach out and accept others, but really much more in that Christian love is an act of our will. In other words, Lord, it's not our will, but your will be done, and your will is that we would love one another uh, in, in treating others and relating to them as God does to us. And, you know, that's the hardest thing because even within the body of Christ, you know, we're not, we kind of think that, hey, out in the world there are a lot of unlovable guys, and there are lovable guys too, but even within the body of Christ, there are some unlovable people, and it's, it's difficult. Because God is saying, hey, I didn't ask you, but I say, hey, my will is that you would love uh, one another. And, you know, it, it's again, Christian love is that act of our will in treating others and relating to them as God does to us. Not because we're so good or so nice. We might think that, oh, God loves me because I'm such a great person and so on and so forth. Not so. Uh, we deserve it, but... You know, some of us, uh, some, some people uh, even think that, hey, we're entitled to this, we're entitled to that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, they think they're entitled to this or that, but uh, God loves us just as we are. God's love for us, and uh, that's how we are called to love one another, love, loving people just as we are. Because we can think that, hey, way back, uh, uh, maybe not too way back, but you might think that, hey, I was a pretty unlovable person. And yet God loved me just as I was with all the blemishes, with all the bumps, with all the hiccups, with all the things that really made me look ugly, you know, uh, and reflected uh, the flesh rather than the spirit. But here he says, love, uh, let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for some by this have entertained strangers without knowing it. You know, people in our lives, we come and go, guys. They come into our lives, we see them act or react to people. Some come, some minister to a spe specific need, some come to visit. But just as quick as they come, they, you know, they were gone. You know, sometimes people would come and go. Uh, some have, have ministered to a specific need, say leading someone to the Lord, and then poof, they're gone. And then all of a sudden, after the fact, you might ask yourself, was that an angel that came? just for the specific reason to minister a word of truth, a word of hope, a word of love, to touch that person, to bring them to encouragement. They might be that one that came kicking and screaming, and they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to be there. But for some reason, that one person came and just uh, 
I spoke that word into their heart and they melted and you know they received the Lord and it was uh, it was just like that uh, was that an angel you know Abraham and Sarah they welcomed three strangers into their camp in Genesis 18 guys he brought them good news of a child being born to them in their old age the child would not only be a blessing to him but a blessing to the, the entire world you know, and what they did was they invited these strangers in. They said, hey, come, we're going to make some bread. We're going to kill the calf, and we're going to have a little bit of a, a, a feast. We're going to show you some hospitality. And without knowing it, they were, you know, entertaining angels. And uh, sometimes, you know, we might entertain angels. And unfortunately, we don't have too many fattened calves around here or stuff like that or uh, the hot coals to big bread. But, you know, we can, we can welcome them in with the love of Jesus Christ. The warmth of the smile, the warmth of a handshake, the accepting love of Christ. In three, he goes on, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. So those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also are, are in the body. Prisoners are not only in jail, guys. You know, I think specifically the Spirit is speaking about those who are in jail, but <coughs> we have a lot of guys in jail. But when you think about it, there are those, they're, they're shut in, they're in hospitals. Some are in nursing homes. Uh, some are shut-ins, you know, they, they, they can't get out. Some, uh, some, some shut-in by their own doings and their own phobias. Uh, some uh, uh, walled in by their own conceived thoughts or notions. Sometimes, you know, our own mind place tricks with us and they, it, 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 it begins to hold us prisoner. It begins to hold us to where this place is. Hey, we can get outside of this box. We can't get outside of these four walls. We're in prison within the thoughts of our own mind. And you know, I don't, I, I don't know what it is or, or what it takes to get them out of that. But like the prisoners in jail, you know, we can go and we can minister. Like in hospitals, we can go in and take the good news. Nursing homes, the shut-ins, and so on and so forth. We go and we do a hospital call, we do a visit. We do just a, a, some things of encouragement. We might sing them a song, whatever it might be. But again, some a little bit more complicated. Uh, I actually heard of a fellow who never left his home for many, many years. Something had happened out there in the world and he was afraid to leave his home for fear of his own life, that somebody was going to take his life or whatever it was. I don't think that was the case, but he just had a phobia that said that, hey, I cannot leave my home, I cannot leave my, my yard. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, there are those there. You know, here in 13, uh, the spirit really gets a little bit more practical as to the instructions and to the things that he's speaking into our hearts. He says in 4, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. You know, pre uh, uh, prevalent in the world at that time was infidelity. We, you know, we, we recall the temple of Diana in Ephesus, where the, the thousand priestesses, you know, they, they worshiped their God at night but with the sexual acts of those who came in. You know, these things uh, of sex outside of marriage may have been rampant. In our world today, marriage itself is kind of passe almost. You know, guys don't even want to get married. They say, oh, maybe, maybe not. Or we'll buy the house, we'll have the kids. Some skip the house, others have two or three kids from various partners and you know, things like that just happen. You know, they got multiple kids, no marriage, no, no husband, or maybe, uh, there is a father figure in the, the life, hopefully, but you know, a lot of things come and go. Marriage uh, brings a stability within the family. Marriage brings a thing that says, hey, we're committed to one another. You know, when you're not married, when you're living together, when you have that thing, it's so easy to just kind of come and go. You, you, you're not happy, hey, that's it. You know, my commitment is very small. My tolerance for uh, uh, situations and problems are very short. But marriage says that thing that, hey, we know that we're gonna stick it out. We know that, you know, a lot of people have said those vows until death do us part, you know, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, that's the case. But, you know, again, he says, let the marriage bed be, 
held, uh, be held undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And when you think that hey, God is going to come and God is going to bring judgment and rain judgment down, uh, it's something that you know, you know we don't want to visit or address. But hey, God is a, a good God. He knows uh, uh, what, uh, what's going on and what it's going to take. But he says, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he, he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. Um, money is a good thing. Uh, uh, so, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? I once heard a guy say that, hey, don't say my name over the loudspeaker. Uh, of this business that he worked at, he said, because some, the, I'm afraid the bill collectors might come, might, might hear my name, and they might come in and try and collect this bad debt that I have. But money is a good thing to have. With it, we can support our families. We can support the work of God. We can help those who need the help. Some may be driven by money, though. Uh, remember, Paul wrote to Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And by some, uh, and some by longing for it, they have wandered away from the faith. See, money is not the root of all evil, but it's the love of money. You know, if money drives you, if money has you captured. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, uh, he says, uh, Paul, Paul wrote to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. The riches not, are not going to save us. He says, don't fix your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us all things to enjoy. It's God the one who blesses. It's God the one who provides. And it's God the one who moves and ministers. Hey, just right, I think, in our needs. Uh, uh, instruct them, to, be, instruct them to, do, to do good, to be rich in good works. That's the thing, yeah. Some people want to be rich in finances. Some people want to be rich in material possessions. Some want to have the bigger home or whatever it might be. But Paul tells us, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be uh, generous and ready to share. Uh, that's a good place to be at. I will never leave you or forsake you is the promise to us here by the Holy Spirit in Hebrews chapter 13. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And you know, um, fear can be a terrible phobia, the fear of fear, the fear of this, the fear of that, the fear of death, the fear of spiders, the fear of heights, it might be many things. The fear of uh, <laughs> going down in a ship, the fear of going down in a submarine, whatever it might be. You know, it might be many fearful things, but God says, the, it, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. You know, in all things, God is the one coming alongside of us to help, to help us in those times that hey, we become fearful. And if, if, if we say that, hey, I'm not fearful, hey, you might be lying, you might be kidding. But all of us have gone through those times of fearful moments. You know, it might be the financial advisor, it might be the doctor, it might be your boss looking at you, oh, sorry, it's time to go, whatever it might be, you know. <laughs> and, and we think that the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. Verse 8, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. The Spirit takes a sidebar right here to remind us of the constancy, constancy of Jesus Christ. You know, it, it's, a, it's a reminder that says that, that uh, Jesus, always having been, never changing, always steady and stable in the future. You know, as a matter of fact, the only certain thing we can take are the promises we have in the Word of God. You know, if somebody ever asks you, oh, can you vouch for that person? Can you vouch for his character? Man, I, I can't but I can vouch for the honesty and the trustworthiness and the trueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, in man, hey, we have no trust, but in God we trust the, the, the things of his unfailing love, the things that he's never changing. He's steady, stable, he's constant 
having been, he's always been, uh, having been, and always uh, uh, never changing, always there, we can count on him. In 9, he says, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, though uh, those who were thus occupied were not benefited. The love of Jesus Christ remains uh, a constant, guys. Uh, there being no varying or shifting like sand, we are, uh, we are and can be strengthened by grace, not the perishable food, but by the favor of God. You know, uh, in John 1.16, uh, John 1.16 tells us, for all his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. I just love this verse. That it's, it's just not one serving of grace. We have a double portion of grace. It's like Elisha telling Elijah, hey, I want a double portion, man. And here it is. We have grace upon grace. Uh, the superabundant overflow of our Lord, guys. Uh, we have not uh, one portion, but the two portions. And I believe a never-ending supply of grace upon grace. And we need that grace. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes we just have so many things weighing down, so many things coming down upon us. It's just impossible. And we just can't think, hey, how is it going to work out? Things are going to blow up or whatever it might be. But we have this never-ending supply of grace, guys. And it's, it's as a matter of fact, it's grace upon grace. And somebody was just telling me that when they read their word, they're always looking for those repeated words in a particular passage of scripture they're looking for the repeating words and the repeating themes why is that it's because God is wanting to remind us God is wanting to tell us God wants to set into our hearts and minds this thing that yeah, I have grace upon grace for you and um, try it sometimes ask the Lord for his grace upon grace for the situation you might be in I, I don't know what you guys but I've done it many times Lord, I need grace upon grace in this situation. And, you know, I, I believe that uh, we have this un, uh, unending supply of grace because we can stand under the spigot of God's grace. And the overflow of his, the fullness, right here it says that... Uh, uh, um, right, right here in John it says that there's a fullness. For all his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. And really it says that God is so filled with his grace, he's just overflowing with it. And we stand in the shadow of his overflow, guys. We can just come and, and just receive all that grace he has for us. Grace upon grace for the situation you might be in, as impossible as it is. Guys, call upon him. <coughs> Verse 10 says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle will have no right to eat. <coughs> I think this is the key verse in this portion of scripture, guys. But from the very beginning of Hebrews, the Spirit has reminded us of God's revelation to us through his Son in these last days. In these last days, God has come and spoken to us through his son as it, it seems to have been they were they were uh, turning from uh, uh, there were some turning from their newfound relationships with Jesus Christ and going back to the old system of temple worship the spirit systematically speaks of Jesus's superiority in comparison to the angels to Moses and then his superiority to the priesthood guys in other words, there's nothing that's superior uh, than Jesus. Jesus tops them all. He's the best, man. He's the way, the truth, and the light. At the altar in the tabernacle, guys, the people were compelled by the law to bring their offerings of grain and animals to be sacrificed by the priests. The priests, as by the law, were provided for by taking a portion of the sacrifice for their own consumption. In other words, the, the priests came, they ate off the people because the people had to bring their sacrifices. The people had to bring their animals. They had to bring their grain. So the priests uh, just benefited because of the law. We as Christians have not uh, per se an altar 
But what we have is a table where we come in communion, to commune with the Lord. He says as often as we have, uh, uh, we have partaken this, we do it in remembrance of what he has done for us, having offered up one sacrifice for sins <coughs> for all times, Hebrews 10.10. 10. In, in Genesis 14 and Hebrews 7, we're reminded of this one called Melchizedek. He was called the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He was the priest of the God Most High. And he came out and met Abram and brought out bread and wine. The tabernacle uh, mentioned here in verse 10 represents the law. The table of Christ with the communion elements re represents God's grace. Along with that grace comes, for, uh, comes mercy and forgiveness. And as we receive his grace and mercy, as we know his forgiveness, we know his peace uh, that comes from life in his son. So, you know, uh, we, we have no thing of uh, th this altar in the tabernacle. The altar represented the law of God. The, the communion table represents the grace and the love of Jesus Christ for our lives. Just like we partook this past Sunday, you know, we took the, the, the bread, we took the cup, and we did it in remembrance of what we, he's done for us. In uh, 11 and 12, he goes on, For the bodies of the animals who were brought into the holy place by the high priest, as an offering for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Uh, as the sacrificial animals were taken outside the city, so too Jesus was taken to the place we know as Golgotha, where he was crucified as a common criminal outside the gate of Jerusalem, guys. And like, like that animal who died for uh, the covering of the sin for that one time, that one year, Jesus Christ came. He died outside the city of Jerusalem once and for all, for the entirety of our lives, for the entirety of all the lives of all mankind, that whoever would come to him should not perish, but have that everlasting life in him and the forgiveness of sins. In 13, he says, hence, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Because of this, the, the, the Spirit tells us, we too, let's go. Uh, uh, we too uh, uh, let go of the, the religious works and identify with the, his reproach or the defamation which fell upon him. So if you get def defamed, or if you get reproached by the world, by the people, and you know, you will. If you go down to the Capitol tomorrow, to the rotunda, and if you can look into the eyes of a lot of our legislators, and if you can look into the lives of many of those who are gonna be chanting for the other side, the pro-abortion side, you'll see the reproach and the defamation within their eyes. Some of them, uh, some of them I, 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 I really think that on, uh, now that they're running for high office and you know, this, is, this is an election year, they put on the, pretty f the, the smiley face and they put on the nice family pictures. But I remember a lot of the uh, times when we were testifying against same-sex marriage, I could see the coldness in the eyes. I could see the, the eyes rolling black backwards within their heads, although it didn't literally do it. But, physically, uh, but, but emotionally, they were rolling their eyes, thinking that, hey, you, you Christians, uh, the reproach that fell upon Jesus Christ will fall upon us, guys, in these last days. But the thing is that, you know, we stand for uh, Jesus Christ. We stand for the unborn life. We stand for traditional marriage. We stand for the tenets of our faith that you know, are being eroded day by day. We stand for the things of uh, one man, one wo woman, and you know, uh, not my husband and my husband, or my wife and my wife, not so. And you know, these are the guys that, you know, when they look at you, they might smile, they might be accepting, but you know, within the, their hearts and minds, you can kind of see it. I don't know, but I don't know if I have a gift, but sometimes I can just see it in people's eyes and even on TV when they zoom in on some of these guys you can see the you know uh, uh, it's not filled with life 
not filled with light, not filled with love, but filled, you know, as uh, they look at you like they looked at Jesus, hey, crucify him, you know, crucify him, get him out of here. Verse 14, we close here, but here we do not uh, have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Remember those in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, guys, there were those who died in faith uh, without receiving the promises, but having seen from afar, from a distance, knowing that God had prepared a city for them. And you know, we kind of, we, we just like that because we look from afar. We confess that hey, we just pilgrims, we just aliens. We just passing through this place where we see this city, the new Jerusalem called heaven. God has prepared a place for us, guys. And we, 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 we trust in that. And one day um, we'll uh, receive the fulfillment, the fruition of God's promises. And uh, in that, we realize uh, the truth in the word of God. God has prepared a city, a place for them. He's prepared a city and a place for us. In the meantime, we occupy. In the meantime, we multiply the talents. In the meantime, we snatch as those from the fire, those who perish without the love of Jesus Christ. In that time, we love the unlovable, guys. We pray for those who persecute us, for those who defame the name of Jesus. Amen, guys? Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you for this evening, Lord, and what an amazing study it is, Lord, and what a gem of a study. And some, uh, some way saying, oh, this is just some practical words of advice from the writer of Hebrews, Lord, but we see so many precepts here that re relate to us, Lord, and relate to the world, Lord, and we thank you, Father. We praise you for the reminder that we ought to be loving one another, that we ought to be loving even the world that hated you, and we pray, Lord, in that light, in that vein, because we know that your desire is that none would perish, but all come to everlasting life, Lord, but we do pray, Lord, uh, again, do move, do minister. We pray, oh Lord, Maranatha, oh Lord, do come. But not until the last one is saved. We thank you, Father. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.